Who needs Grammys? The actual awards you want are coming at you in this show. Plus, the latest, greatest news on all the coaching hires and superstar guests. We got all that and more, and it is time for Zero Blitz. Welcome to Zero Blitz with Frank and Fitz, presented by Prime. And you're right. Every time I say it, it just feels better that way. He's Frank Schwab. I'm Jason it? Fitz. Yeah, it just it, <sighs> it rolls. It flows, man. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and he, and he, <laughs> it's just, these are the things. Like, this is what happens. I, I, you know, Frank, did you, like, is there a big nickname for Frank Schwab? Or he's just Schwab? Like, is it, I've is never gotten that. It's like I get the lame, like, hockey guy nickname of Schwabby sometimes. Like, you know, just putting a Y at the end of your last name. That, that, I, I've never had a good one, though. Never had a good I, one. I have an issue with hockey nicknames because the whole point of a nickname to me is supposed to be about brevity, right? So why are you making my last name longer? Like mm. if you're giving me a nickname, but you're adding more length to it, that's not a nickname. That's that's a longer name. I'm not in for this. And like the problem is when your last name's Fitz, everybody calls you Fitz, which is fine. I love that. That's what everybody calls me. I have very few people actually call me Jason in the world. And I get that. But like that's not really a nickname. It just feels like my name is Fitz. Like I just like, I don't know, like Sex Machine. That's a nickname. Fitz, not a nickname. <laughs> You know, that's just. I, I, do people I don't know Fitzy on you? Do, do, do oh, they yeah. let Fitzy's? Fitzy's, Fitzy's got to be one, right? Yeah, yeah. I never really thought this through. Yeah, I've, I don't think I've called you Jason ever. Like, yeah. I don't. I don't know that most people would. Yeah, it's it's much much more fun when you got we have Fitz. That's. Both of my parents were always called Fitz, and they, when I was a kid, sixth grade, these are the story times for Jason Fitz you didn't ask for. There were six Jason Fs in my sixth grade class, right? What? So what? that was the first year that I ever went by Fitz because we all got called by our last name. And uh, the, one of the bands I was in before I ever made it, music that uh, just we just right on the cusp, never made it. We had three Jasons in that band. So everybody went by. It was Minor, Fitz and Carson. Like we all went by last names because like it's just so Jason is such a wildly popular name that I lost it a long time ago. But I do still tell people that my name is Jason, because when you get introduced as Fitz, especially in a loud place, they think you're saying like Chris or Vince or whatever. So I'm like, I always feel like I, it's, it's like I'm that guy that's like, I'm Jason Fitz, like you're supposed to know me no it's just i want you to know that, that i have a first name and a last name and everybody i don't i don't know this is a very long story frank did you, I don't know did you ever doing. think of the band name fits in the tantrums i, I think that uh, would fit that would that'd be a good you should have gone with that like, yeah that's you know uh putting on the that. fits pitching of fits the number of things that uh, especially espn found every possible way to uh, use throwing of fits pitching of fits causing of fits all all of all of this this is this is my I, got nothing. Okay. I, I feel so bad now. i got nothing just schwab whatever schwab yeah. schwabby yeah. Schwab, yeah. Schwab, yeah. Schwab, yeah. Schwab yeah. like schwab uh like people I don't call know. me franklin oh, almost yeah. as a nickname almost because that is my name but it's weird for people calling me franklin if they're not my grandmother so you know stone is just uh contributed if the shoe fits all also heard that one. We've got uh, all the thoughts you could get on the head coaching hirings. We're going to do that with Michael Lombardi a little later in the show. And we've got some superstar special guests coming on later in the show. I'm just saying, going to make everybody really smart with some super popular super guests. Uh, in the meantime, before we get to what we're going to do, which is end of the season awards, some superlatives, we're going to rank. So we're, we're going to give out some trophies that don't actually get trophies. Frank, before we get to any of that, any thoughts? Mike McDonald, I know we'll talk and cover this with Lombardi in a few few minutes but uh, you got dan quinn with the washington commanders you got mike mcdonald with the ravens did either of those hires make your no no place to say yes yes uh a couple defensive coaches which is i, I thought the trend was just going to be from now until whenever offense 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 and you understand why quarterback's so important you want that guy to bring along your quarterback but i like both of these guys i think dan quinn is is set up well to be a, a, a head coach a second time i think retreads get a bad rap I, sometimes it's just hey you're on the job the first time you're learning things you might not get it all right and dan quinn was pretty good still his first time around as a head coach he goes does great great work as defense coordinator cowboys not in the playoffs necessarily but overall great job with them players love him i think that was a pretty good hire the mcdonald hire is really good i think i i, I just have been really impressed with what mcdonald has done the last couple of years all the players rave about him, how smart he is, his schemes, everything. So I like both of the hires. I think the, uh, I think Seattle, it was a little surprising. They went defense just because they had a defensive coach. They usually go the opposite. You know, you go with an offensive coach, I guess same for Washington, but we will see. I, I like the youthful exuberance of McDonald. I like the Quinn hire, both of them. I, I'd give B, B plus, you know, I, we don't know if it's an A yet, but B plus is fine. 
Uh, before I give you my analysis, the real question, would you rather party with Brady Quinn, Dan Quinn, or Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman? I'm giving you or. Uh, what's what's Brian's last name? Brian Quinn. Uh, Q from Impractical Joker. So I'll give you that. So you have oh, Brian right. Quinn. Yeah. You have you have Brian Quinn. You have Doctor Quinn, Medicine Woman. You have Brady Quinn, and you have uh, 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 you know Dan Quinn. So uh, who would you who, who'd I, you rather? I, I don't know. I'll take any of the others except Dan Quinn because whenever Dan Quinn gets brought up around me, I have jokers like you and our producer Stone spending five minutes pointing out that I look like Dan Quinn because all white all dudes with a goatee look alike. I don't know. Is that a thing? Right. So Dan Quinn, apparently I've already gotten a couple jokes about getting to Washington job this morning. That was fun. On tech. Dude, you can so, make a living yeah, with this yeah. stuff though. Like impersonators go make good bank. Like I could, I could go around the circuit next week in Vegas and be like, I just wear a Washington hat and be like, Hey, anybody want to talk about me getting the job? Yeah. I, I could probably pull that off at least a couple oh. places. Right. I mean, for a long time, every dumbass that was tall with the cowboy hat tried to be an impersonator of Alan Jackson. Like, come on. Like, I, I think you've got real, you've got potential here. Like, we, this is a side hustle. You know, I, I don't know if you're searching for representation in the side hustle, but for a cool 15%, I'll see if I can get you some Vegas and like, they got shows down there. Like, we it might be a way for us to get into some parties. Like, you come out there and say, hey, this is Prince. This is Michael Jackson. And this is Dan Quinn. Like, I, it feels like a, a Vegas that opens show. Doors. Doors. That's opening all the doors. <laughs> Yeah, Dan Quinn. Yeah, I'll wear the backwards hat, which I usually do anyway. It's gold. We got it. We got it. Oh, man. All right. I've taken us wildly off the rails. Uh, I will say this. I felt like Washington particularly was going to make a splashy hire. And so maybe the problem here yeah. is, I, I mean, new ownership group, new GM, you're talking about a new stadium, all these things that come into it. I really thought Washington was going to come in and just blow everybody away. Now, if you listen to inside coverage and if you haven't been listening to it, shame on you. What the hell are you doing with your time? Uh, I would say that C. Rob and Jory have been telling me since the beginning of the year that, that Dan Quinn not only was going to get opportunity, but deserved opportunity. So I'm not surprised to see this happen. I just don't know. Like if I put my fan hat on and you told me today that the hire was Dan Quinn, that's going to turn decades of just embarrassment from the franchise around. I don't know if I'm buying that. Like, I like it, it's fine, and I hope it works out. It's just not necessarily the billboard inspiration I think some people expected Washington to give the world. Yeah, and I think part of this too. In speaking of this, who would have thought if you would have what three weeks ago or whenever it was given me odds on Bill Belichick and Mike Vrabel not having a job right now? I, I wouldn't have believed you. I, I mean, it, so yes, I mean, for, for those two guys to to be passed over for uh, Dan Quinn and Mike McDonald, I don't know if it's a bad hire necessarily. The only problem I do have with this hire, it, it, this it doesn't really apply to Seattle, but I think it does apply to Washington. Washington has a second pick. They're going to draft probably Drake May or Caleb Williams if he falls. Maybe Daniels, we'll see. Anyway, they're drafting a quarterback number two. The problem with the defensive-minded head coach Yes, you could hire an offensive coordinator, but if that coordinator does really well, he's leaving. And then you got to start the whole process again. You got a different play caller for this young quarterback. Whereas if you have an offensive minded head coach, had they been able to land a Ben Johnson, Ben's going to be there for the next however many years until he gets fired or just retires 40 years from now. So that's the problem with hiring Dan Quinn right there. Not necessarily that it's not splashy, just that who's the coach that's going to bring along Drake May, probably. It, it, Dan Quinn's only part of that equation. You need a good offensive coordinator, but if that offensive coordinator is too good, he's leaving in a year or two. So, so we'll see on that aspect. But the priority number one for Dan Quinn is fire, uh, finding the right quarterback whisperer to go with whoever they're going to draft at number two. Now, everybody's going to tell us that the Belichick shadow will loom large over the NFL next year. Hear me out. I would argue that the Vrabel shadow is going to loom large over Ohio State next year. Think about it. Oh, We've heard repeatedly wow, that's a job wow. he covets. And Ohio yeah. State has gone out and spent money in name, image, likeness, transfer portal, right? They, they went out and said, we are going to bid our way to, and we've seen this in every professional sport. The question is, can dream teams essentially work in college football? I don't know the answer to this, but I don't think there's a coach in college football this year that will have more pressure than Ryan Day from week one. And if they falter, especially in an expanded playoff world, if, if they somehow don't make the playoffs, if they somehow underperform, if they somehow lose to a Michigan team that's supposed to be rebuilding, if they, if this season, season does not live up to expectations man i feel like vrabel is going to sit back there and say i took that year off i kept my guaranteed money from the titans and now i'm gonna go get that cash that bag i'm gonna get paid to be a buckeyes coach like i i feel like vrabel is going to loom large over college football this year yeah, that's a heck of a call i could see it i could see it that'd be 
that'd be a fun hire. <laughs> it really would be because, you know, obviously Ohio State fans are not thrilled with Ryan Day at the moment, it doesn't seem. So, yeah, he could be one of those rare coaches that goes 10-2, and two, and it's like, that's not good enough, you're gone. So, and especially Mike Vrabel sitting out there, yeah, that, that's He gets that's complete to control, too. Now. He doesn't yeah. have to worry about a GM or an owner. He just has to worry about an athletic director. We know none of them have any power. All right. We wield our power now because it is time. This is where you insert the orchestral music in the background and the polite applause, perhaps a tuxedo, if that's the way you're feeling today. It's time for our end of the season superlatives. Uh, awards. Uh, we don't have trophies. We're not giving you a trophy. So just back <laughs> off. Okay. Wasn't it so a budget? No. Maybe okay. we could get like the graphics team to build a little trophy and then we could throw that out to somebody because like, I feel like the recipients of these are going to really uh, want those. So we've, we've got some different categories here, almost like the yearbook at the end of the year. Uh, shout out to Avril Lavigne, by the way. And a lot of people don't know this story. When she tours at the end of the year, she always puts out a yearbook like you did in high school that has yeah. everybody in the yearbook so that they can remember the tour forever. I love that idea. Uh, so we're doing that here. We got our superlatives. So let's start, Frank, with the story of the year. What say you, sir, for the story of the year? And my overarching story, I did think about officiating because it's mm. becoming something we just can't ignore. Like this is almost an every week thing where we're complaining about officials and the ridiculousness at the end of the Lions Cowboys game and all that. But I just settled on bad quarterback play. And I hate to be negative around here, but I thought that this season was very, very choppy and it goes back to the bad quarterback play. Now, some of this is out of their hands. We didn't know Aaron Rodgers was getting... Achilles tear four plays into the season or Joe Burrow was going to hurt his wrist or I, we had a lot of Deshaun Watson all these we had a lot of quarterbacks Kirk Cousins go down season ending injuries way too early that really hurt the quarterback play then we had some veterans who didn't play otherworldly like I know this season is going to be remembered for Mahomes dragging that team to a Super Bowl but he wasn't great this season Brock Purdy had more yards per game passing so I just thought quarterback play across the board with a few exceptions was pretty much down we could see that with, with the MVP race, which changed every week pretty much because nobody was taking it by the horns. And I thought that that really affected the play. I, I mean, when you're watching all of these games, you know, it doesn't sound like much if, you know, four or five teams have lost their quarterback, but that means four or five games out of your eight in the early window are just kind of ruined and, and they're not very fun to watch. So I'm looking for that, hopefully, to rebound next year. Some of these young guys get better. We did see, you know, look, Jordan Love at the end of the year. C.J. Stroud, who I love, obviously. Uh, even Brock Purdy's a young guy, third youngest starter and quarterback, third youngest starting quarterback in Super Bowl history. These guys can maybe help us rebound next year at quarterback play because when quarterback play is bad, the NFL is bad. When quarterback play is great, the NFL is great. That was my story of the year because it kind of, I thought, overshadowed a lot of things. I, I love that call. Um, I went a little different direction for my story of the year. My story of the year is franchise revivals because we've seen such a moment from the Lions, particularly that I don't think we're ever going to forget, like the way the nation came together and watched the Lions do this. Plus, I was sitting there covering the draft a year ago when everybody said, well, the Texans, you know, they just traded away uh, first round equity and, and we'll see what that means for them because they could be picking at the top of the draft again next year. Like everybody thought the Texans were going to suck. Right. So seeing the revival of these teams into something different, something bigger, something better, like seeing the Lions, the ultimate lovable loser, that a team that we remember historically for going 0-16 more than we remember for anything. Like we rarely talk about the greatness of the Lions when it comes to Barry Sanders or Calvin Johnson we talk about the fact that the Lions are so bad they forced these players away from the game early like that's the narrative on Detroit and so to see them not only become good this year but become what at least it looks like from the outside looking in could be sustainably good that to me is the greatest story this year because as we walk into next season it, a it gives hope to every fan base of a team that sucks but b it also changes the way we're going to look at this the Lions will be a Super Bowl darling pick for several teams so I feel like the revival of franchises that were left for dead year in and year out was actually the cool story of the year to me. Yeah, I, I mean, you talk about the Lions, like uh, that that could have easily been my story of the year. I thought it was great. And to your point, it's not just the fans of teams like the Texans and Lions who can really take heart in this. It's teams who have been down for years and years to say, hey, the Lions were two seasons ago, like, what, what was that, 26 months ago? They were 0-10-1. And here they were up 24-7 in a conference championship game a couple of years later. So I think fans of every team who's down right now can look and say, if we just get the right GM, get a coach that that 
brings us to another level. Hit, hit a couple draft picks. We could turn this thing around just like the Lions, just like the Texans. So I, I think that that's a that's a great call for for story of the year. All right. So next, let's go, and this can be general. Anything you're thinking, let's go with person of the year. Just the the person of the year for Frank Schwab this year in the NFL was. Yeah, almost like the old Sports Illustrated Sports Person of the Year, right? Like this isn't MVP because, well, Lamar Jackson's winning that, and we've debated that for months and months. But I thought. Who am I going to remember from this season and why? And you could go in a bunch of different directions. You go with Bill Belichick. I, I mean, not in a great way, but we're going to remember this maybe being the end of his career or whatnot. A lot of people applied for this. But to me, it was Christian McCaffrey. And I'll tell you why. I don't know that there's been a player who just excites me week in and week out. Like the, He is so good. He's jumped up my rankings as far as like greatest running backs of all time. I, I mentioned it briefly the other day with you. That if, if the 49ers win a Super Bowl, maybe even if they don't, look at his numbers and some of his big seasons compared to guys we think are in the top 10 all time. Go compare him to Marshall Falk. Go compare him to LaDainian Tomlinson. Like guys like that, like legitimately Christian McCaffrey's having that type of a career. And for him to have this type of season, led the NFL in yards from scrimmage, led the NFL in touchdowns in total, awesome in the playoffs with 260 yards of four touchdowns in two games, going to the Super Bowl. It's a lot about narratives right now. It's about big trades. The 49ers are not a Super Bowl, I don't think. If they don't make this big trade for Christian McCaffrey last year, that was awesome. That's a trend that we'll see. And also the whole running back debate. What are running backs worth? Are running backs worth this, worth that? Well, Christian McCaffrey's showing you could still be a superstar at running back. You could still be the kind of guy who logs 90% of the snaps. It doesn't look like a guy who should be able to log 90% of the snaps. He's not Derrick Henry, but he does so. He's an unbelievable goal line runner. So when I think back on this season, there's a lot of things I will remember, but to me, it's Christian McCaffrey. I, I just think he's had a tremendous season, and he's one of those guys who I'm going to remember. Yeah, I, I, I was... We we're pretty lucky to be watching Christian McCaffrey week in and week out. I don't think we think of him in these historical terms yet. Top 10, whatever, top whatever. But he is to me. I, he's getting to, growing to every every single season with Christian McCaffrey, he moves up that list of all-time greats. I love everything you just said. And I can't believe I feel like you're right. Now it's it's sort of dawning on me. We're underappreciating Christian McCaffrey to a certain extent, extent, which is tough to say when he's so appreciated. But yeah, you're right. What we're seeing from him at this point is not only historic, but it's just year in and year out. It's just it's alarming to me if you no matter what you got in return for, if you're the Carolina Panthers, you got to look around and say, man, like we had we had the best player in the planet in our organization and we let him go. We couldn't figure out how to make it work in a way that, that was manageable and sustainable for us. I think that's one of those things that a fan base remembers forever. Like we had Christian McCaffrey. So uh, I'll speak to another player. I think that deserves all the flowers that they got this year. And I'm going to go with Tyreek. As you were talking about Christian McCaffrey, I think one of the best stories of the year also was that we spent much of the year wondering if a wide receiver would have a shot at MVP. And that's largely because of the greatness of Tyreek Hill, who never stopped talking, but never stopped backing it up. And the number of games we saw this year where everybody knew he was getting the ball and nobody knew how to stop it is one of the most beautiful things we've seen at the wide receiver position in a world where in a world where the wide receivers have gotten better and better throughout the course of the league. And we have so many guys that that most generations would be the guy of his generation right now playing in the NFL. Tyreek might be the most uncoverable because everybody knows exactly what's coming and nobody knows how to stop it. And injury to, obviously took away from his season. But I can honestly tell you right now, I, I don't know with Tyreek, I don't know how great that offense could be without him. He is such a dynamic game changer, not just to, to the scoreboard, not just to the yards he puts up, but frankly, to the way you have to defend everybody else because you're defending Tyreek. I just think that this year, one of the most incredible things we've ever seen was that run, particularly the first two thirds of the season where Tyreek was uncoverable, unstoppable and an MVP to me. So that, that stands out. Yeah, he's an example of, hey, if you don't have an elite quarterback, Go get yourself an elite receiver and he can elevate the offense. Or if you do have an elite quarterback, he can make that elite quarterback even better. And the one thing that always stands out to me about Tyreek is how slow he makes everybody else look. Like, you are, these are the best athletes on the planet. And Tyreek, when he gets the ball at open field, he makes these guys look slow. That's hard to do. It's, it is hard at any level. Like, Victor Wembayana makes everybody look short, 
right? Like Tyreek Hill makes everybody on the field look slow because he's so fast. He's absolutely breathtaking as a player. And I so want to, I want, I, I want MVPs to not be quarterbacks anymore. I'm waiting for the next non-quarterback. And Tyreek really made a run at it. I, I'm hoping that happens soon, but great call. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Tyreek is a guy who he's, he's in that category of dudes we're going to remember from this season, just uh, being exciting week in and week out. I love your comparison on his speed because I feel like we forget, I keep saying this, that there are fat guys that, you know, you could run up behind just re- regular Joe Schmo in the street with a flamethrower and start chasing them. They're running for their life. They still can't outrun some of these fat guys on the team. So to see Tyreek do what he does, just outrunning people that run for a living is it's surreal. All right. So from person of the year in a good way, let's go to the most ridiculous person of this season. Let's uh, throw a little shade at somebody. Uh, who does Frank Schwab want to throw his shade towards? You know, and I thought of all the weird stories of the year. I kept coming back to one team and it was the Denver Broncos. I had to pick somebody out from that. So it's got to be Sean Payton. Think about the year we've had with Sean Payton, right? Like he's kind of the last minute a uh, trade, I guess, from the Denver Broncos to come get him. Fine. We spent all offseason talking about Peyton and Wilson. Are they going to get along? Are they going to get along? Then we get into training camp, and he absolutely napalms Nathaniel Hackett and that staff. Like, I've never seen a current coach rip another coach before. And then the next day, Sean Payton has a gall to say, I just forgot I wasn't on Fox anymore. Like, oh, my goodness. Okay, Sean. Ah, nobody's believing that. Then we get into the season, and the Broncos had this really, really strange season. They give up a 70 spot to the Dolphins. They look like the worst team ever. Then they have this crazy revival, right? Like, all of a sudden, the Broncos are back in playoff contention. They fall out of that. Peyton is screaming at Russell Wilson on the sideline during the Detroit game. And then it comes out when they bench Russell Wilson at the end of the year that they went to him in October and said, hey, if you don't give up this clause in your contract that's an injury guarantee, we're going to bench you for the rest of the year, which blew my mind. And it blew my mind even further to Sean Payton tried to act like he knew nothing about it. Like they're going to bench his starting quarterback and Sean freaking Payton is not going to know about it. So from beginning to end of the Sean Payton experience, it has been absolutely zany, weird, wild, and yes, ridiculous. Sean Payton, my ridiculous person of the year in the NFL season. I I love that, by the way. And the, the roller coaster of emotion that Broncos fans felt this year uh, is is real. And that'll always be remembered. We have no idea, by the way, I should say loudly, no idea if this Sean Payton thing is working yet. I don't think we, we've seen anything to let us know. And that division just got a lot tougher uh, with a with actual capable head coach coming to the Chargers. Uh, I I I was thinking about a lot about this and I was going to stay out of this lane, but you know what? You've inspired me, Frank. You've inspired me to just rip off the bandaid and, and really call out the most ridiculous person of the year in the NFL this year. And without hesitation, it's Aaron Rodgers, right? Like just the (laughs) fact that Aaron Rodgers was a story, even though he played like eight seconds of football this year. And it was a story that never went away. Every other quarterback that got hurt this year, at some point, at least the conversation stopped. You could watch a Vikings broadcast and not have to hear about Kirk Cousins 432 times in the first quarter alone. You couldn't even click on a Jets article without in the first few seconds hearing what Aaron Rodgers thinks about something. And look, you got a platform. You want to use a platform. Fine. Go use your platform. But then don't tell everybody that you need to keep the distractions out of the building when you're very part of the distractions that we're all sitting here talking about. So this ridiculous portion of of it is that somebody that didn't even play any worthwhile football this year was part of our narrative for the entire damn season. You know what's more annoying than 30 seconds of Taylor Swift on a broadcast? Hours and hours and hours of talk about a quarterback that had an Achilles injury and was never seriously going to come back on the field. But we did it over and over and over again on all the shows. People sat here and said, we got to talk about Aaron Rodgers. Everybody listened to every word he said. And it's ridiculous to me that even now, if I try and read what the Jets are up to most of the time, what I'm going to hear about is a report about how Robert Sala is handling Aaron Rodgers. The most ridiculous thing in the NFL this year is we spent the year obsessed, not with Taylor Swift, but with somebody even less worthwhile to the outcome of his team this season, <laughs> Aaron damn Rodgers. It fits. You think Packers fans are happy where they're at right now, not dealing with this nonsense and having Jordan Love? Uh, I think so. You are absolutely spot on. And I'll say this for article of the season, our colleague, Charles McDonald absolutely nailed it when everybody's having these serious discussions and news reports about Aaron Rodgers is going to be back from an Achilles injury. Our guy C-Mac was like, 
are you guys serious? Really? No, go back and read that. He nailed it. He nailed it of everybody needs to actually be in reality here. Aaron Rodgers is not coming back from an Achilles injury. But then to add on to your points, the Jets still activate him in the roster. They said, no, he's not going to play, but we're activating him anyway. They had to cut some poor fullback who actually needs those checks. Uh, just, <laughs> yes, Aaron Rodgers, th- I, that's great. I, I probably would, I would vote for yours over mine. Aaron Rodgers was the most ridiculous person in the NFL this year. All right, on to happier news. Uh, Let's go to the game of the year. What do you got? Uh, I'll go first on this one, Frank, because I'm making you go first every time. For me, when I think game of the year, I think moments, I think conversation, I think the the entire world watching, right? That Bills Chiefs playoff game in, uh, in Buffalo, where Mahomes gets his first true road playoff game, and goes in and wins, man, I just think the power of that moment is what I, when I think back to this season, year in and year out, the the Lions are going to be a great part of it. And there'll be some moments from some games that stand out. You know, some of the decisions on fourth down will stand out, right? But when you think game of the year and what they're going to just keep replaying year in and year out over and over and over again, man, I have got to put, from for my money, I got to put Chiefs bills on that because of what it meant for both organizations, because of the environment, because of the snowballs being thrown, because of the ice, because of the coverage, uh, because of the rivalry, all of those things together. Make that the sort of game you can't forget. That's my game of the year yeah and uh, it's great obviously F- fantastic game fantastic theater uh with the two quarterbacks everything that went along with that i i have this weird fascination with greatest regular season games i, I just think that, that we always forget about them because we always focus on the playoffs and i thought about some of the great regular season games we had dolphins chargers week one which was awesome and kind of announced that the dolphins are going to be a really really fun team to watch our producer stone pointed out the jets beating the bills on monday night in week one great the aaron Rodgers injury all the way to the punt return at the end that was fascinating theater some of the bills regular season games are great the ridiculous broncos game going back to how ridiculous the broncos season was when the broncos won there eagles winning in overtime but ultimately did go back to the playoffs and settled on the nfc championship game because i don't remember look We've talked about the Lions a lot. I'm not from Michigan. I'm from Wisconsin. I don't even root for Michigan most of the time. I I definitely was rooting for Washington in the national championship game. Let's put it that way. So I have no ties to the Lions. I have no fondness for the Lions. Growing up, they were division rivals, right? But I was all in on the Lions in the NFC championship game. And I was on a roller coaster of, oh my God, they're going to make the Super Bowl. It's 24 to 7. This is going to happen. And then just the ridiculous fall on that roller coaster when they blew the lead, the fourth down calls. I just think there was such great theater in that game. The ups and the downs. It didn't have one of these great endings, you know, a a last second play to win it or anything like that. But I thought the entirety of those three hours just encapsulated what it means to be a fan, what it means to to root for a team. I was, I'm not even a Lions fan, and I felt like a fan in that game because I, I just wanted to see that story happen so bad. I could only imagine what Lions fans went through. That's the most. That's a game of the year to me because that's the most memorable game. That's the one we'll be talking about years and years from now. Uh, shout out to I, – I'm sorry I don't have Twitter open to look at it, X open to look at it, but definitely the tweet of the year for the show – was one of our listeners tweeting in and calling those Campbell's gambles. I'm stealing that. that. So Campbell's good. gambles, so definitely the uh, the the way that that one's going to be represented. Let's get one more superlative in here. And I'm going to stick with the game I just mentioned because I think it creates the saddest fan base of the year. That, to me, has to be Bills fans because you can't make an excuse. You can't compartmentalize why what happened happened. You just got to look at it and be like, yeah, we just got to be better, right? And, and when you got to be better – that's just no easy answer to that. Like, how do you beat Mahomes? I don't know. Like, we had home field advantage. We had everything lined up for us. There's nothing easy we're going to go acquire that's going to make this happen. I think it, it has caused a tailspin of sadness for Bills fans. So I make the Bills fans the saddest fan base of the year. But there's a lot of suck this year. So there's plenty of fans <laughs> that could say this. I, I thought about this a long time because there are so many candidates. You could just go to the bottom of the barrel with the Patriots or the, or the Panthers and just say, you guys were some of the worst teams in the NFL. That That's going to make you sad. Jets obviously apply here. They spend literally all offseason getting excited for Aaron Rodgers, and they see four plays of him. They probably should be number one here. Lions, obvious. I don't even need to talk about that. But the one I come back to is the biggest fan base, the Dallas Cowboys. 
I mean, imagine mm, every single so year you haven't been that a conference championship somehow, some way, it just seems so fake of a stat that they haven't been to the conference championship game since 1995. But every year it seems like they have a top two team in the NFC. This year I thought, how would they not get to the NFC championship game? They're the second best team in the NFC, two home games to get you know to San Francisco to play the 49ers. And they just get run out by the Green Bay Packers at home. And then they get Mike McCarthy back, which nobody wanted in that fan base. So of all the sad fan bases, I just think the Cowboys might be the saddest because they actually were good this year and have nothing to show for it. Absolutely zero. They're not going to have any good memories of the NFC East championship there. I don't think raising a banner in Jerry World for that. Nobody's buying the Cowboys NFC East champions t-shirts exactly. They're just going to remember those three hours when the Packers actually ran them off the field and then keeping Mike McCarthy in a, in a sad, sad offseason. So Cowboys fans, I feel for you. You are my saddest fan base of this NFL season. Yeah. You might have actually talked me into this. I think you're 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 calling that's actually a better one because you're just looking in the mirror and you're saying McCarthy again, All right? All right. <laughs> right? Like what's Jay? Like if they had hired Belichick, at least you're having a different conversation. It just seems like this is going to be every single year of the Dallas Cowboys' existence, where it's like, oh wow, they went twelve and five. Oh no, they went zero and one in the playoffs. Every single year, it's going to be that way, and nothing is really going to change. Uh, you know, as, as we look back across this, I think we missed the obvious answer story of the year cigars in the locker room, person of the year, Max Crosby, ridiculous person of the year, Josh McDaniels game of the year, 63 points on the chargers and the yeah, saddest fanboys of the years, everybody else in the AFC West. Cause the Raiders are going to dominate for every generation now, <laughs> but I just had to get all those out. Like just no, no, no homerism at all there. No homerism at all. Uh, yeah, there, there we go. All right. So Frank, uh, as we look back at this season, there were some amazing performances that delivered teams one step closer. Closer to football glory, thanks to our friends at Amazon Prime. We want to single out two individuals who really delivered. Frank, get weird with me. Whatever the word delivered means to you, who delivered the most this season? And I thought about making this guy my man of the year, but Houston Texans rookie quarterback C.J. Stroud, think of how he delivered hope to the Texans fans and delivered so many great moments to us NFL fans. You're just like watching great players. I've never seen a rookie quarterback like C.J. Stroud. He was amazing from day one. Not even the first pick of the draft. He's the second pick. And, you know, he has a couple games early in the season where you're like, this kid looks pretty good, but come on, he's a rookie. He's going to struggle. He never really did. Not saying he was perfect, but all the way into the playoffs when he has that great game against the Browns and sets records there for the Texans, you just felt like we are watching the next superstar of the NFL. That is really, really rare as a rookie. It was awesome to watch Stroud's development. The Texans dig themselves out of the gutter. They were maybe the NFL's worst franchise coming into the season. Now, because of Stroud and D'Amico Ryans, they have a ton of hope going forward. The delivery of the year to me, C.J. Stroud, he's here already. He has arrived as a star. He's going to be a superstar. He's going to win an MVP someday. C.J. Stroud, one of the absolute great stories of this NFL season. C.J. Stroud has been so good this year that the way we judge rookie quarterbacks for the next five years is going to be different. Yeah. Like, yeah. you cannot And you're going to have to almost the give the other guys a pass. Like, well, he wasn't as great as C.J. Stroud, but he still had a really good rookie season. That's the kind of bar he set. It was unbelievable. Like, the stat that kept uh, getting thrown around was, like, what, the only guys in NFL history to have the greatest, the best uh, touchdown-interception ratio and best passer rating it was like 1989, Joe Montana, 2007, Tom Brady, and this year, C.J. Stroud. Like, you're that company with those iconic guys and those iconic seasons. You had yourself a heck of a rookie season. And got a bunch of young guys that are only going to keep developing with him. He keeps his offensive coordinator. Like, I I just, I feel like next year, it's gonna, life is going to be tougher for Jaden Daniels, uh, for Drake May, for Caleb Williams. Yeah. Life is going to be tougher for Anthony Richardson when he comes back uh, from True. his injury. Bryce Everybody's going to be, Joe, yeah, Bryce, yeah. This, there's going to be the qualifier in the room of C.J. Stroud for the foreseeable future. I love that, that call by you. When I think of delivery, though, I'm going to go a little different. I'm going to go with Greg Olson. Now, there was a big debate on analytics during the uh, course of the broadcast and since then with Greg Olson. But this is what I love about listening to Olson. When I, 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 I'm a big believer in this. I don't think there's anybody in the world that is going to turn off or turn on the Super Bowl because of who's calling a game. I just don't believe that. So I, I don't believe that most of us are sitting here forming our watching patterns based on who is or isn't behind a microphone during a game. That being said, 
the person at the mic has an incredible opportunity to make everybody smarter in a way that really improves the football watching experience. That's what Greg Olson does to me every single week. He manages to take little tidbits. He puts them together quickly and he gets them out to the audience in a way that makes plays make more sense. That's the ultimate power. Like I know that everybody fell in love with the concept of, you know, Romo go going out and just guessing what the play is going to be and getting it right. Like that's fun. But more than that, I don't need somebody to tell me what the play is going to be. I need somebody to tell me why a play failed or succeeded. And I don't think anybody in our business does that better in a more concise way than Greg Olson. So when I say deliver, I think it's because all of us that watch Greg Olson work are smarter after the game because of it. Everybody thinks they could do that job. They can't. It's a tough job. It's a tough job to watch in real time. You don't have the... Uh, you know, the film to go back and watch, right? Like you, you are have to diagnose things in real time. It's in seconds. And Greg Olson basically went straight from being a tight end in the NFL to the broadcast booth and did that seamlessly. He did that as well as anybody. He could break down a game. He's engaging. He's entertaining. He's smart. Uh, yes. I think he is the best color guy in the NFL right now. Maybe the best in all sports. He's fantastic, fantastic job by Greg Olson. I totally agree with you. He, he's he's one of the stars of the NFL uh, broadcasting uh, realm. All right, those are your playoff deliveries from the 2023 season. Whatever you're into, from shopping to streaming, it's on Prime. Visit Amazon.com slash Prime to get more out of whatever you're into. So I just gave you my thoughts on Greg Olson. So coming up, we're going to get Kevin Burkhardt's thought, his partner, and Greg Olson's thought. They're joining us next on Zero Blitz. We'll talk analytics. We'll talk Brady. We'll talk all of it. Stick around. Hanging out with Greg Olson, Kevin Burkhart. You guys uh, are joining us on behalf of DiGiorno, doing some cool things, ways people can get some free pizza, which I love. We'll get to that in a second. First, let's talk about what everybody's talking about, analytics, because I've heard Greg's side of this. Kevin, I haven't heard you say much yet. You guys saw the game. Everybody's talking about it. So now that we've had a few days to sort of react to what we saw from the Lions, Kevin, what are your thoughts on the way it all went down? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, we were just talking about it this morning again. Like, you know, I, I as the three years, last three years working with Greg, I have, you know, really learned a lot more about the analytics side of the game because he's so in tune with it and learned about, you know, what these coaches are thinking and doing. And so, like, I was not surprised one bit with uh, any of the decisions. Um, that's what Dan Campbell does. That's what the Lions are very good at. That's why they've been so good. But I, I posed a question to Greg this morning, and, and we, we talked a little bit about it Sunday night after the game, too. I guess from a fan, I totally get why he, why he went, and I would have gone, too. But I just was also thinking, OK, there is a point when do you ask yourself, do we need some kind of positive momentum in a second half, which has been an avalanche for the 49ers? Do we need something to go our way? So I get it. The 48 yard field goal is not guaranteed. But I think if you're looking for, you know, another argument, that would be that would be my thought. That was my thought while it was going on. That was my thought while Greg was explaining it. That would be the only thing I understood it. I would have gone for it, too. But there was a part of my brain was thinking, man, they could use something, just anything to, to get some momentum. And then obviously it would have tied the game. So um, I was OK with it. But I certainly understand the people who were not. And that was probably most Alliance fans. But you know, as Greg always talks about, it's not the outcome, right? It's like the decision that you're talking about. So um, I was not surprised one bit. It's just they didn't make the plays. You know, they had a couple big drops and didn't work out. And Greg, where's the line? Because everybody keeps talking about the feel of the game versus the analytics that we see. So from somebody that played the game, when you're in a game and your offense maybe is struggling and you're in a second half where things aren't going easy, where's the line between what the analytics tell you and just the feel of the game? I think that's the question that everybody, you know, is trying to kind of decide. And and I think the biggest thing to, to keep in mind specifically about this game was, and, and it's kind of was along the lines of my kind of sarcastic tweet yesterday, reading it, you know, everyone talking about, you know, just take the points, take the points. The notion that these field goals, 48 yard field goals to tie the game are just foregone conclusions is is ridiculous, right? There's nothing about taking the points in this. Now, last year in the Super Bowl, me and Kevin are calling it 42-yard field goal. Harrison Buckner, one of the best field goal kickers in the league, fourth and three. Andy Reid decides to do what? Kick it, take the points, get the lead, make it 10-7. He missed it. He doinked it off the upright. 
oh man, Harrison Buckner made a bad kick. You know, when, when the kicker misses, it's the kicker. When you miss a fourth and three, it's the coach made a stupid decision. You know, it's, there's nothing take the points about this. It's not a, it's not an extra point. These are 48 yard field goals. That's not necessarily Badgley's cup of tea anyway, from long distance. So Dan Campbell went into that game. We said it early in the broadcast. This was a race to 30 points. You were not going to keep San Francisco barring some crazy picks and turnovers under 30. Dan Campbell scored 31 and they lost. So the notion that conservative offense was the way to win that game, it's just, it's not reality. You know, it's just, it's, it's very, it's very easy to bash the decisions of Dan Campbell. If, if Badgley misses the 48 yard field goal, does it make it a better decision? Uh, but I think there is this moment, Greg, where it feels like there's a separation right now. There's a bunch of guys that are absolutely anti-analytics and a bunch of guys that are absolutely pro-analytics. What's it going to take to get all of these different sides to play in the sandbox together nicely? Like in five years, are these conversations still happening or do we eventually normalize to the analytics side of this? I think some people will come. I think some people will come to the realization that whether they like it or not, this is the way NFL teams are operating. This is the way decisions are being made. Dan Campbell did not decide in that moment in time in the NFC championship that he was, that decision was made three years ago. And that decision was made last Wednesday when they sat around and and made out their game plan about how they were going to attack the game and what they thought was the best chance for them to have success. So I I think there's going to be people who never come around on analytics and that's okay. But I do think it is the role of broadcast teams and it is the role of analysts and broadcasters and play by play guys to, to educate people into the why, right? It's not so much like bashing it down their face and saying, you have to believe this or else you don't know football. I don't think that's the conversation at all. I think the conversation is here's why you're doing it. Here's why they're considering it. And here's what the stats say. Here's what the data says. You know, Dan Campbell was 14 to 17 on fourth and three all year. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good conversion rate. It's better than the field goal kicker from 48, but people don't want to have that conversation, right? It's he missed it. So therefore it was the bad exam. It was a bad reason. So I I think it's the pendulum is going to continue to swing. Well, more people will come in line and, and understand, but not everybody. And, and that's okay. Meanwhile, he, he did take the points at the end of the first half. I mean, like, I, you know, fourth down decision. And, and and so you're talking about, Jason, I think you're talking about like where, you know, to me, it's just common sense, right? It's like, I'm with you. It's, oh, it's, it's like politics today. You're either way one side or way the other side. Like, can we just have a little thought process and understanding? So that was, a, what was that a fourth? Was that a fourth and goal from the four, Greg? I'm trying to think what that, what that yeah. was at the end of the half. And like, yes. you know, that's kind of a little more dicey once you get four yards, five yards. But I think he felt like 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 most people would. You know what? Going to the half up seventeen is not bad. Like th- going up going up three possessions, pretty good. So like it's it's not always cut and dry either. He did kind of you know uh, decide over that one and kick a field goal at the end of the first half. So there was that. I think this measured approach is what has made you two suddenly a very beloved tag team when it comes to greatness in calling a game. You guys have become absolutely one of America's favorites every single weekend, right? So. Let's also address the elephant in the room everybody continually talks about right now, which is Tom Brady. And Kevin, I think this is interesting from your standpoint because you're working with a friend and doing great work. But also there is this this other side of it of like Brady's presumably coming in next year. How do you balance the moments in the booth and trying to figure out what's right right now and also getting ready for the future with him? Yeah, listen, it's 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 been a crazy two years, right? I mean, to to have to sit back and basically answer this question every week for the last two years, it's been a unique situation. And I think the way that I've dealt with it is just by staying in the present. Um, you know, that's that's the bottom line. Like, I, I just don't I don't know any other way and I haven't known any other way. It's just, you know, show up, Greg and I, you know, do the games that we do and do a broadcast that we're proud of. And do that and deal with it. But has it been fun dealing with the question every single week? No, it hasn't been fun dealing with every single week. Um, and obviously it hasn't stopped this week going forward. So it's, it is it it is what it is, Jason. You know, I, I don't make that decision. Greg doesn't make the decision. I know this. I know for the last three years, Greg and I have done broadcasts that we're both really, really proud of. 
And, and I'll say this, like, look, it's my job to ask the question, your job to answer the question. We all get exhausted by it. Greg, I won't ask you a question about Brady because there's nothing you can say here, right? I get that. So let me just ask you this. What do you want your future to be as a broadcaster? Yeah, and, and I, I have no problems answering it. You know, obviously we understood what we signed up for two years ago when the situation presented itself. And obviously I was anxious and, and, and eager for the opportunity to call the number one team, and which obviously we knew was going to culminate with the Super Bowl in our first year that Kevin and I were with this crew, um, you know, last season. So, but as far as what I, my, my goals in this world have not changed. They're not going to change. If anything, I would say I'm even more eager and excited to call top games and call number one games. That has, that was my goal getting into this when I started after I retired back in 2021, my first season with Kevin on the second crew. It was my goal last year. Obviously we were able to call Super Bowls. This year ends in an NFC championship. And my goal going forward, whenever that is, wherever that is, is to call number one team, you know, call number one games and be on a number one team. And Wherever that is, however that works out, who knows, right? There, there are so many uncertainties. There's so much speculation and rumor and, and so many moving parts to this world. And the reality is there's only a handful of seats, but I have no doubt in my mind the work Kevin and I and our crew, um, you know, Aaron and Tom and, and our crew, what we've put on tape, right? And it's like the NFL, the tape doesn't lie. Right. You, you put, you put on tape is who you are. And that's what every single team in the league judges you by. And that's all that matters when you're a player and, I would say the same thing with us. You know, the tape doesn't lie. You know, what the, the broadcast that we've put together over the last three years together, Kevin and I, and the last two years in, in these chairs, I, I think speak for themselves. I think people understand, you know, what, what we're able to bring and the, the perspective and the information and maybe a little bit of a different nuance to the broadcast that maybe they're not accustomed to hearing over the years. And uh, we're proud of that. And I, I stand on that. I I know we can do this. Obviously, Kevin's going to continue. I, I, I know I can do this. I've, we, we've proved it. And whatever opportunities are out there moving forward, I'm excited to explore and, and see when and how, you know, to get back to that opportunity. And, you know, obviously, unlikely that it's at Fox in the near term with, with Tom coming. And I understood. I signed up for that. And that was not a surprise to me at all. Um, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see how the rest of it unfolds. But I know I'm a top broadcaster. I know I can do this as well, if not better than anybody in the industry. And we'll see how it all plays out. Everything you just said speaks to what makes you a great broadcaster, what made you a great player. It's part of the reason everybody's gravitating. So, gentlemen, you have made this entire season fun for so much of America. It's it's a blast to get to talk to you. And it's been a blast getting you guys, uh, to get, getting to watch you guys work every week. Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. There's nothing better than two guests, but... We'll do our best with one, the great Michael Lombardi. You know Michael hangs out with me every single week. And Michael, I've been wildly excited to talk to you about the Ravens, specifically Mike McDonald, the head coaching hire. How concerned would you be hiring a coach that's 36 years old? Well, I, I think, you know, it's what situation does he walk into? He's got a really good general manager, John Schneider, who's been around Pete Carroll for 14 years. He worked for Marty Schottenheimer back in Washington as the general manager. So he brings a lot of experience to the job, which will certainly help Mike McDonald. I think that's really important. I think the imbalance, you don't want young and young. You kind of want young. And then it depends also how willing Mike McDonald is to listen, right? I think that's part of the job of being a head coach is getting information that you can rely on and then acting upon it. To me, what makes the hire, what I appreciate is the fact that what he was able to do in Baltimore. I think Baltimore's defensive team is interesting in the sense that it, it's not filtered with these elite players. Yes, Kyle Hamilton's very good. There was Marlon Humphreys, a good inside nickel corner. You know, Roquan Smith is very good at a linebacker. But there's a lot of guys, two specifically, Clowney and Kyle Van Noy, that they picked up off the street that made significant contributions. And if you're John Schneider, you're saying, hey, if he could do that with that team, I've got better corners than he had. I've got better defensive personnel overall than perhaps Baltimore have, maybe not the elite level, but I think I can make this go. And and getting a young coach who's proven he can game plan and develop talent is what the game's all about today. So stick with Schneider for a second, because from a young coach's standpoint, how much of an advantage is it's something we talked a little bit about uh, with Charles Robinson yesterday on inside coverage. I feel like for a coach coming into it, is there an advantage coming into a, a structure that's more built here where, you know, presumably more things are being handled in the right way from the day you walk in the door? 
Well, I think they're looking for a little bit of a change. I think if they wanted the same, they probably would have hired Dan Quinn, right? Because Dan Quinn was there. He knows Pete Carroll's system. Dan Quinn got hired after McDonald by the Washington football team. So to me, this is about we want a little bit of a change. Maybe bring some of that Baltimore-Michigan program with you to Seattle. Look, here's the facts. They have not been a very good home field team. This is a place that should be hard to play. They haven't been able to get control of the game with their defense. You know, Pittsburgh goes in there, runs the ball effectively, throws it, wins a game in December against them that really ultimately cost them an opportunity at the playoffs. So I think this is about we're going to shift our culture, we're going to shift our behavior pattern, and we're going to try to go with something different in terms of where this is all going to lead us as we as we move forward. And I think ultimately that's what they need to do. And McDonald will give them a different spin with the culture that's in place and change it. So you mentioned Dan Quinn, but before we get to Quinn with the Washington Commanders, let's get to the guy who said no to the job, at least according to all reports. Were you surprised that Ben Johnson elected to go back to Detroit rather than take a head coaching gig? I was not convinced he was the number one choice. I think Ben Johnson is a guy that if you talk to people last year and that interviewed Ben Johnson, they thought he was quiet, reserved, perhaps a year away. I'm not sure that Washington felt that he was the clear cut winner. I think he was in a pool of other candidates. Remember, they interviewed Quinn and then they were going to fly to Detroit to interview Johnson again. I think if they thought Johnson was the guy, they would have been in Detroit waiting for him to get done. So I think a lot of that is the narrative that's going on. We know that Johnson is a good coach. He's a very good play caller. He's a very good tactician. Now, he also has got a team that's going to come back. So next year will be a better opportunity perhaps for him where he can interview for a head coaching job that he feels comfortable. Washington has a lot of cooks in the kitchen. I'm not sure as a young coach you want to go to an organization with a lot of cooks in the kitchen. So who is Dan Quinn in your mind for the commanders? I think what the Stan Quinn hire is, is they're, Washington's trying to borrow the model of what, what Detroit did. This is collaborative. Now, you know, you say Detroit's one. It's a collaborative effort. Brad Holmes, Dan Campbell, they collaborated together and worked and, and filled it to thing. Successful. Great. I'm not sure that's always going to work. The two teams in the Super Bowl have a collaboration, but the head coach runs the organization. Nothing happens in San Francisco without Kyle signing off on it. Just read his contract. Nothing happens in Kansas City without Andy Reid signing on off it. Just read his contract. So to me, you know, collaboration is good if everybody's good at their jobs. We'll see in Washington. I think, you know, to me, it's an interesting combination of Adam Peters and Dan Quinn coming together. Dan, you know, you had an opportunity to talk to Mike Vrabel. You didn't do that. You had an opportunity to talk to Bill Belichick. You didn't do that. You picked a coach who took a team to the Super Bowl and lost. And you replaced them because you replaced a coach who took a team to Super Bowl and lost with a team with a coach who took a team to the Super Bowl and lost. So we're going to see how this goes. And hopefully it, it goes in the right direction. But I think as a Washington fan, you know, you had a chance to get Brable, You had a chance to get Belichick and you chose to go this collaborative way. I don't know if that works. Uh, the collaboration is such an interesting point. The way you phrase it is so interesting because you're right. Like, I think at some point we have to acknowledge the two teams in the Super Bowl don't necessarily have collaboration, but the guys are hitting on all cylinders. Like it's working the right way. So if you're Vrabel and you're Belichick, you may not have been as interested in collaboration. So it's interesting, like where do you weigh the candidate you're talking to versus the way you think you want business to be run? Like the Titans made it very clear. They want this big collaboration. Do any of us really know if that's going to work better than it did with Vrabel? We have no idea, right? Well, same thing in Atlanta, I, you know, and I and I know Charles wrote a column about the not hiring Belichick and and he made the points that they felt like this organization from a front office standpoint was suited to continue to grow. I respect that opinion. But to me, they were they've won 21 games in the last three years with Terry Fontenot as the general manager. Right. And if Terry Fontenot really wanted to win and he was wanting to be somebody that could advance his level of intellect, then he probably would have hired Belichick. But if he wants to keep his power base and not feel threatened, then he's going to hire someone like Raheem Morris, who's not going to change. Look, this is all about self-preservation. There's an old saying we had in the league going back to George Young when he was at the New York football giants, guard your desk. There's a lot of guarding your desk in the NFL. People are scared and intimidated by what the change is. And if you're an owner like Clark Hunt, who basically had Scott Pioli sitting in his office and he went out and hired Andy Reid and Andy Reid fired everybody in the building, 
and started with his organization, that works. If you have owners like Josh Harris and you have owners like Arthur Blank, who really didn't want to disrupt his organization, those guys probably aren't the best hires for you. That's uh, interesting. So do you think Vrabel and Belichick are back in the league? It's all, I mean, Vrabel, obviously younger, seems like it's hard to think he's never going to coach again. Where do you think Bill uh, – do you think Bill ends up back in the league? Oh, I think there'll be an owner or two that want, that want to win bad enough that they'll call. I think to me this is kind of – we're going to see this collaboration, how it's all going to work out, right? We're going to see how it's all going to manifest itself. And if you've studied the NFL as much as I have and if you've studied teams as much as I have – I kind of know where this is going to go. And I think ultimately both will be back in the league next year. Yeah, it, it is interesting to me, especially the Vrabel portion of it, because it felt like the world looked so much at Tennessee up and down and said, hey, Vrabel is not the problem. And now you've you've got a bunch of coaches and, and they may work out, Michael. Like, I want to say this. It may work out. It may but, work out. But like, there's so little proof of concept to the guys that have been hired this year. I just I think it's fair to say. I don't know. Like, is Brian Callahan going to be a good head coach? Who the hell knows? Like, I, I I just think that that's the real analysis for so much of this is like you're trying something and it may work and it may not work. But you knew what you had with Rabel at some point. The, the whole league knew what they had with Belichick and with Rabel and they chose to go in a different direction. We won't know for a few years, but it feels like that's the sort of thing that will bite somebody in the ass somewhere. Well, I think it's all about protecting, guarding your desk, right? You can't tell me that the, the team of of Raheem Morris and Terry Fontenot is better than building Belichick and letting him win. That's six Super Bowls. But look, let's be clear here. The guys doing the hiring, could they really interview Vrabel? Could they really interview Belichick? They, those two those two happen to know more football than the people doing the interview. And when that happens, usually the people don't get the job. It's a guard your desk is going to be, I'm going to steal that from you. And I'm going to use that in my analysis moving forward all the time, because one of the most interesting things to me in any organization, you've talked, you've talked so much and really taught me over the course of this year, how important structure is. But I think what I'm learning as we continue to talk is that it's structure without ego is much more difficult, right? Like, so a, you got to identify exactly what the structure of your organization is going to be B from an ownership standpoint, you got to be selfless in that structure when it comes together and ask yourself what's best for my business to actually win not not what do i want what makes me feel good but what's best for my business to actually win that takes structure without ego i don't know how many people can accomplish that no i don't think they can and nobody you know they say in atlanta rich mckay is no longer involved well you know obviously the coach that they hired raheem morris was rich mckay's number one choice so don't tell me that that this hire wasn't beneficiary to other people within the building and I think what you really have to take a hard look at is the person itself, right? I mean, are you willing to work and compete within the arena? And a lot of people aren't. They would rather just guard their desk and not move forward. And then they try to sell their fan base on, we are really trying to win titles. We are committed to excellence. If you really are, Mike Rabel probably would have been your coach if you really are, because he's got a proven track record. I'm rolling the dice with Callahan. I'm rolling the dice with Mars. I'm rolling the dice with Quinn. Vrabel has won, and we saw it with a team that wasn't overly talented. So for me, I think that's the conversation. But look, it doesn't surprise me, Fitz. In 1975, interviewing with Paul Zimmerman, Bill, Bill Walsh described this situation perfectly. He said, whoever sits with the owner on game day and the personnel director and the president, they sit together, they convince the owner that everything that's wrong with their organization has to do with the coaching and the development of the talent. And what happens is the owner listens to him because he really doesn't know. And then by listening to him, he'll make changes with the staff repeatedly. And then eventually these co these people in power keep their jobs. That's the cycle that Walsh talked about in 75. It's here today. Uh, somehow, some way, we will together break the cycle of suck. That's what I'm going to call it from now on. Uh, Michael, always doing great work. You can check out the Lombardi line that airs on VEASAN weekdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, weekends, 10 a.m. Eastern, as well as his weekly GM Shuffle podcast. Check out all of Michael's NFL takes at VEASAN, V-S-I-N.com. Michael, my friend, thanks for hanging with me. Thank you, Fitz.
No Sunday Night Blitz this week. Charles back on Tuesday with the exempt list. You don't want to miss that. We're going to be on Radio Row and hanging out, all of us from Yahoo Sports, throughout the course of the entire week. Frank Schwab and I will be together in person, so things I can promise you will get weird. But I can also promise you, you should be checking out all of our content on all of our platforms. We'll have all the celebrity guests you could possibly ask for. We'll be doing shows with guests all over the place. It is Can't Miss All Week live from Vegas, so we'll make sure we get you caught up on everything. Follow us on Twitter, at Jason Fitz. Thanks, everybody that took the time to hang out with us. Stone at SJ Rochelle, producer behind the glass. Be sure to give him a follow to leave us that five-star review. Rate, subscribe, tell your friends, your family, tell your enemies, tell everybody to hang out. We'll be back next Thursday with more Zero Blitz from Vegas. I can't promise I'll be sober, but we'll be doing the show.